Chapter 1 The Function of Dogs in Nineteenth-Century America Henry Carey, ten years old, who resided at Gloucester, N.J., was attacked by a bloodhound, about a fortnight ago, and was so terribly injured that he died soon after. Accompanying the boy was a small dog, which attacked the savage animal and fought him desperately in defense of the child, but was terribly torn himself. Trenton Gazette, December 1864 This historic case of a fatal dog attack in New Jersey is significant because it can help to create a frame of reference by which we can begin to study the causes for dog attacks. Addie Tynally, this 19th century newspaper article can begin an examination into society's changing attitude towards dogs and how certain forces have come to shape and influence the public's perceptions of canine aggression over the past 150 years. From small local newspapers, such as the Appleton Post Crescent, to major publica, tie-ins like the New York Times, severe dog attacks on humans have always been reported in the news as they seem to be of both interest and dismay to many people. Maladies, dis, cases and accidents unrelated to animals cause thousands of deaths daily, many of which go unreported in the newspapers. However, Fatal attacks by dogs have always gotten a ten tie-in in the media, despite or perhaps because of their rarity. Historically and in the present day, dog attacks cause on average only one to two dozen human deaths per year in the United States. Yet millions of people live in close proximity to dogs and have daily interactions with our canine companions. These interactions run the gamut from the most positive and rewarding relationships to cases of abuse and neglect. Yet the number of incidents a year involving a human fatality generates a shock and dis-belief which has never been proportionate to the number of dogs, the frequency of exposure to them or the myriad situations in which dogs interact with humans. While the study and examination of individual cases of fatal dog attacks on humans can provide insight into canine behavior, equally revealing is the examination of human reactions and interpretations of canine behavior after an attack. One remarkable aspect of the human-slash-dog bond is the extreme and often emotional public reaction towards an episode of fatal canine aggression. Another relevant and significant factor is the style of media reporting of these incidents. How the media presents these cases shapes and influences future public reactions and emotions in subsequent cases of canine aggression. As seen in the case cited above, besides reporting an individual attack, the author of this article also gave recog, nit ion to the uniqueness of the human-slash-dog bond. Implied in this account was the understanding that the small dog had a familiar bond with the young boy and hence would exhibit behavior vastly different than the bloodhound, which was unfamiliar to the boy. This has long been the essence of the human-slash-dog bond, that dogs will exhibit or inhibit natural canine behaviors in service or defense of those with whom they have formed attachments. In fact, the dog is the only animal in the world which can be expected to attack another being in defense of the humans with whom they have formed a bond. This behavior is one of the cornerstones on which thousands of years of dog ownership and maintenance have been based. And implied in this relationship is the expectation and acceptance of canine aggression in certain circumstances. The Greek philosopher Plato acknowledged this basic principle of canine behavior over 2,000 years ago when he wrote, The disposition of noble dogs is to be gentle with people they know and the opposite with those they don't know. The Republic, ch. From ancient Greek culture to newspaper accounts from the 19th century, Humans have historically demonstrated a keen understanding of the essence of the familiar bond between dogs and their masters. 
Only recently have both the media and the public failed to acknowledge or recognize this basic principle of canine behavior and the significance of this bond in the display of canine aggression. For this reason, dog attacks, human perceptions of canine aggression and the role of the media in reporting these events need to be examined, begin, ning from a historical context. Throughout recorded history, Dogs have been owned and maintained, not for their ability to befriend all, but for their ability and willingness to forge alliances. The appeal of dogs was the natural bonding of dogs with their owners to the exclusion of others. In a time and world fraught with dangers, dogs were often relied on to be a front line of defense against threats by other beings. Dogs readily accepted this role and for centuries have served as guardians and protectors of their master and his possessions. Alliances between men and dogs were often invaluable as travelers huddled by lonely campfires in the wilderness or walked desolate roads and trails herdsmen slept more soundly knowing their faithful dogs were protecting their livestock and livelihood from thieves, wolves, bears and mountain lions. History is replete with accounts of dogs saving their masters and mistresses from all types of predatory animals, of both the two-legged and four-legged variety. All breeds of dogs have the ability to perform the basic natural canine behaviors, hunt, ing, tracking, chasing, fighting, herding, guarding and protecting. But over the centuries humans have manipulated dogs through artificial selection to exhibit specialized natural canine behaviors. Historically, dogs with specialized abilities were grouped or classified by function. Groupings typically included scent hounds, hunting dogs, war or fighting dogs. Shepherd or guarding dogs, toy or companion dogs, and mongrels. Some breeds we know today as a specific phenotype, appearance, previously income, passed a number of different looking dogs that performed a similar task. The Bloodhound is an example of a type of dog that today is an individual and unique looking breed, but in the 1800s, Bloodhound often described a type of dog that was used for scent tracking and did not necessarily denote a particular appearance. While breeding for a specific look began to gain widespread popularity in the late 1800s, for many centuries function was more impertant than appearance. The wonder of dogs is that they can be manipulated to excel at performing a particular function and they will then perform this function in service to those with whom they have formed attachments. In service to their masters, dogs track, fight, protect, chase, herd, guard, and hunt everything from large game or predatory animals to small vermin. Dogs often forsake their own kind on command or in defense of their owners. But of all the funk, tie-ins that dogs are required to perform, perhaps the most controversial, and often the most disastrous for dogs and humans alike, is the task of protecting man from his fellow man. Guard slash protection dogs. Protection or guarding has been one of the primary functions of dogs throughout their alliance with humans. This function was an important element in the acquisition and maintenance of dogs in the 1800s and early 1900s. To serve in this capacity came quite naturally for dogs. As pack animals with a social hierarchy, Dogs seem to easily embrace the concept of friend versus foe or known versus unknown. Dogs were also understood to be territorial and this served well in the guarding of homes and businesses. As predators, dogs are physically able to serve in defense of their masters, and differ, and breeds were developed to enhance this ability. Just as one would not brandish a sapling to ward off an attacker, Small dogs were not routinely maintained as protection or guard dogs. Large, powerful breeds, such as the Mastiff, Newfoundland, Bulldog, and Bloodhound, as well as huge mongrel dogs, 
were used as guard dogs in the latter part of the 19th and Turi as their size enabled them to excel in the task of guarding and protection. Less than ideal conditions, and many times seriously abusive conditions, frequently accompanied the ownership of guard dogs in the late 19th century. Newspaper accounts of dog attacks were often brutally honest in their description of the attack and of the treatment and care the dogs received at the hands of their owner and or victim. It was not uncommon for accounts of dog attacks to state that the dog was beaten or abused by either his owner or the victim prior to the attack. In a much less litigious society there was less apprehension in revealing unflattering details about individuals and their behaviors than is now permitted in the recounting of events that contributed to a fatal dog attack. Fortunately, this aspect of late 19th century and early 20th century society allows us to have enormous insight into the factors that precipitated and contributed to severe canine aggression. While accounts of such attacks were always sympathetic and mournful of the injuries to the victim, this did not interfere with the observation of the events that may have con tribute to the attack, and so, in many cases, we have a vivid account of the circumstances and or trigger that set some of these dogs off into a frenzied and unrelenting attack. Many of the guard dogs in the latter part of the 19th century were kept chained for long periods of time in cellars or sheds until they were needed to patrol factories, slaughterhouses, livery stables, stone yards, warehouses or shops. In December of 1882, a bookkeeper boiling a kettle of water at a packing house in New Haven, Connecticut, was savagely attacked by a large bloodhound kept on the premises as a watchdog. The dog lacerated the man's throat, severed an artery in his arm and bit him more than twenty times. While the animal's behavior was not excused, the dog was referred to as savage and a brute, the attack was not viewed as inexplicable. The article goes on to recount that the dog had previously been punished by the night watchman with a kettle of scalding water. By using the kettle, the unsuspecting bookkeeper triggered the bloodhound's recollection of the brutal treatment by the watchman, causing the dog to attack. In February of 1888, a butcher in St. Louis, Missouri, owned a two-year-old newfound, land dog that was trained to guard his shop at night. The dog was kept chained during the day and was known and encouraged to be vicious. The butcher entered the yard one evening to release the dog and when the man claimed the right to rule there and enforced his claim with a kick, the dog responded by furiously attacking him. For members of the butcher's family rushed to his aid, but the man's chest, neck and arms were so severely lacerated that although not dead at the time of the report, he was not expected to survive his injuries. While not directly physically abusive, the owner in the next account placed the dog in circumstances which clearly were abusive and stressful. This 1893 report offers the important details that contributed to the aggressiveness of the dog involved. It describes how a baker found a cur dog on the streets of New York City and chained the dog in his bakery cellar where the temperature reached over 100 degrees much of the time. This newly acquired, chained, heat-stressed dog not surprisingly attacked the baker when he entered the cellar to light the ovens. While it was not unusual for guard dogs to rebel violently against their abusive owners, the majority of their victims were usually unsuspecting children or unfortunate adults who happened quite innocently to encounter these fierce animals. A common thread seen in many of the attacks by guard dogs on innocent victims can be found in the account of an attack in the summer of 1874 on a small girl in Brooklyn, New York. A large Newfoundland dog had been recently obtained by a hair dealer to guard his shop at night. In the morning before being taken to the basement to be chained for the day, the dog was taken to the backyard of the store to be fed. In the midst of eating, 
a three-year-old girl approached the dog. The dog lunged at the child, seizing her by the shoulder. The child's cries brought her father rushing to her aid. After some determined effort, he got the dog to release the child, but in the process had one of his fingers bitten off. It was determined the child's wounds were serious and may prove fatal. The hypocrisy of keeping guard dogs is that when the dog is called upon to fulfill the task of protection by attacking an intruder, the dog is almost always viewed as vicious. Most victims of guard-slash-protection dogs were not burglars, but children or respectable adults who entered the property to visit or conduct business. The inherent problem with guard dogs is that they are expected to assess the legitimacy of the intruder to justify an attack. Of course, this is impossible. Whether a person entering a property has legitimate reasons to be there or whether they are intent on evil doing is not within the comprehension of dogs. The dog views the intruder as either an unknown or known being, and as either a threatening or non-threatening situation. Clearly, any attack on a child, even if the child was an intruder or provoked the guard dog in any sense, was unforgivable, dooming the dog to immediate destruction. The fate of guard dogs that attacked an adult allowed for only the slightest chance of redemption, but only if the intruder was clearly intent on criminal activity or if the intruder was con cited a social outcast or an unsympathetic figure. Mentioned frequently in the keeping of guard dogs during the 19th century was the task of chasing away tramps. There seemed to be a measurable level of aggression allowed guard dogs in chasing off these social outcasts. In June 1879, it was reported that a woman living three miles out of town, Fort Wayne, Indiana, owned a Newfoundland dog that was a terror to tramps. The recounting of the attack on a tramp entering into the woman's yard is one of the few reports that did not describe the attacking dog as savage or a brute. After describing the owner beating the dog to release his victim, it was noted that the tramp got away without a second warning. A Newfoundland protecting his mistress on the outskirts of town seemed to fall into the classification of acceptable canine aggression. The fact that the woman fought furiously to free the tramp from the dog's grip, along with the fact that the victim was viewed as unsympathetic, made this attack more palatable. A fatal dog attack near Findlay, New Jersey, in 1889 clearly demonstrates that some canine and human behaviors, even against tramps, were not permitted. A brief article noted that authorities were investigating a case where a farmer was reported to have looked on as his savage dog killed a tramp. The unfortunate victim was then buried in a field. Point six a common thread seen in the recounting of dog attacks, both historically and in more modern-day cases is the transference of cruel human traits onto dogs. There were no unkind superlatives assigned to the farmer who stood by and looked on as his dog killed a hapless tramp, yet his dog was described as savage. Time and again, dogs encouraged by their own heirs to act aggressively and allowed to be dangerous are assigned vicious or treacherous traits, while the owners responsible for the behavior found in their guard dogs appear to escape without noticeable public criticism. This is not to say that owners in the late 19th century and early 20th century were not at times held responsible for the actions of their dogs. There were cases when owners were arrested, fined or sued civilly for the injuries their dogs inflicted. But public condemnation of guard dog owners usually resulted only when there was extreme negligence or when own heirs incited or actively encouraged a dog during an attack. A notable exception to this was a disturbing incident that occurred in the spring of 1884 in Rockaway, New York. 
The article detailing the events leading up to the attack takes a rather indirect route before finally implicating the owner as the responsible party for the grievous injuries inflicted on the victim. The case involved a woman inspecting the grounds of a hotel on Long Island before taking possession of the property for the season. It was noted that no one informed her of the large bloodhound kept on the premises to guard the unoccupied hotel. Upon entering the grounds, the woman was almost immediately set on by the dog. A watchman who heard her screams ran to her aid and only with great diffy, Culty succeeded in getting the dog to release the woman from its grasp. The woman was gravely injured and after the amputation of one badly mangled arm, it was pronounced that she was not expected to recover. Early in the newspaper account it was insinuated that, prior to her arrival, this unfortunate woman should have been warned by the owners of the prop Bertie about the dog. The article concludes in a much more direct fashion, stating, The bloodhound has been the terror of the neighborhood for some time, and the fact that so dangerous an animal was permitted to roam about the hotel grounds has drawn forth the severest condemnation. Decatur Daily Republican, April 12, 1884 the position guard dogs found themselves in during the late 1800s and early 1900s was far from enviable. The line between a justified attack and an attack that would cost the dog its life was thin indeed. Guard dogs had no way of distinguishing a burglar from a visiting neighbor, or a tramp from a peddler. Yet this distinction was critical in determining the legal and moral accountability of owners for injuries caused by their dogs. This distinction was also critical in determining the nature and ultimately the fate of the dog. A dog that attacked a tramp was justifiably protecting its owner, a dog that attacked a peddler was ferocious. The interesting aspect of reporting severe-slash-fatal attacks in the late 1800s was the recognition and admission by owners of the potential danger of the guard dog prior to an attack. The owners and persons managing these dogs knew the threat they could pose, as this was ultimately the true function of the dog to be dangerous and ward off intruders. The problem was, of course, that with no direction or training by their owners, the dog decided who was an intruder based on its own perceptions. In 1879, an account is given which perfectly describes all the behaviors, circumstances, and events which culminated in one near-fatal attack by a guard dog. Judge Fane, living about four miles from this city, has a very large and savage dog which he keeps as a watchdog upon his premises. He had only had the animal about two months and during that time his niece, Miss Mary Hamilton, was the only member of the household who could with some degree of safety, go within reach of the animal, which was kept chained all day and turned loose at night. Miss Hamilton fed the animal, and by kind words and gentle treatment managed to control it. On Friday evening, when she went to unfasten the dog, she was accompanied by Miss Fanny. As soon as the animal was given its liberty it at once jumped upon Miss Fanny and after throwing her to the ground began to tear away at her. The article goes on to describe the behaviors seen regularly in severe and fatal attacks and intense focus on refusal to release one victim, despite the attempts of rescuers. It is then reported that a gun was finally procured and that the first shot into the side of the dog, instead of killing the animal it only seemed to make him more vicious. The second shot fired into the dog is described even more graphically, the muzzle of the gun was placed so close to the dog that the flame scorched its shaggy coat. This was successful in Mac ING the dog released the woman but the article goes on to describe the final act of this enraged animal. The second load seemed to stagger the brute, and as he fell Miss Fanny jumped up and ran in the direction of the house. The dog, rallying from the shot, pursued her a distance of twelve steps and then fell dead in his tracks. 
Decatur Daily Review, September 3, 1879 Like most cases of canine aggression, this attack was the culmination of circumstances, events, and human and canine behaviors which provided both the means and opportunity for this dog to engage in an episode of extreme aggression. The events begin with the acqui sit ion of a dog for an intended function as a guard dog and escalate from there. Newly acquired dog dog known to be vicious and encouraged to be aggressive dog chained for long periods of time with little human interaction, with the exception of the owner's niece familiar bond beginning to be established between dog and niece, this excluded her from being the object of the dog's aggression but the bond was not yet strong enough for her to maintain control over the dog. Dog released from chain, many dogs explode out of kennels, doorways, or off of chains in a rush of excitement. This release could also have been interpreted by the dog as the silent consent of the niece to drive off the intruder. Dog's perception of the unfamiliar woman as intruder. Dog's intense, focused and unrelenting attack on the intruder. This incident demonstrates that canine behaviors follow the intent of the owner, who in this case had bought a savage dog to protect his family from intruders. The fact that the behavior of the dog escalated into completely unacceptable levels of aggression was the result of the original function of the dog, coupled with mismanagement, failure to con, troll the dog and the failure to anticipate the results of allowing the dog to be potentially dangerous. On the rarest of occasions, a guard dog attack fell within all the parameters of accept, ability. A case where three dogs accomplished their protection duties with stunning precision occurred in Indiana in 1902. A wealthy farmer was riding home with three large dogs in the back of his wagon when a highwayman stepped out, grabbed the horse's reins and drew a revolver. Before the highwayman could react the farmer turned the dogs loose on the would-be robber. The dogs attacked the man, knocking him to the ground, biting him and tearing off his clothes. The farmer called the dogs off and rode home. He returned later with a search party and found that the unidentified man had died from his injuries. The key to this attack being deemed acceptable was that the dogs were acting under the control of their owner, and were directed by human perceptions of what was a valid threat. The owner assessed the situation, perceived it to be a real threat and then permitted his dogs to behave aggressively. The decision to attack came from the owner's interpretation of the situation, not the dog's. The problem with guard dogs is that when the owner is not present, the dogs operate solely from a canine perspective as to what constitutes threatening behavior. The child approaching perilously close to the dog's food bowl is a potential robbery, the woman enter ing a chain dog space is a home invasion, and a boy retrieving a ball into a fenced yard is a trespasser. The dogs may be taking appropriate actions from a canine point of view but are making serious and often unforgivable errors in judgment from a human perspective. One century ago, owners of guard dogs knew them to be dangerous, and encouraged this ferocity. Despite the understanding expectation of guarding behaviors from dogs, these behaviors were rarely excused after the fact, I see, attack. However, every once in a while a clear mind put aside the emotional aspect of a dog attack and showed a reasonable and genuine understanding of canine behaviors. An incident in 1891 demonstrates that, despite being attacked by his guard dog, one gentleman not only understood the situation from the dog's perspective, but also allowed for the dog's error in judgment as he, the owner, should have anticipated it. A farmer in Salem, New Jersey, purchased a mastiff dog to guard his residence. A few days after acquiring the dog the farmer entered the yard late in the evening. The dog sprang on the man, 
knocking him to the ground and biting him on the arms and legs. The farmer stated he had forgotten the dog was in the yard and he blames himself for letting the animal loose before it knew the members of the household. New York Times, August 8, 1891 Tracking or Scent Dogs While guard dogs were owned by a significant percentage of 19th century Americans, dogs used for tracking and or law enforcement were not nearly as numerous. Yet the function of these dogs at times required them to have aggressive traits similar to those of the guard-slash-protection dogs. Ideally, the primary function of tracking-slash-scent hounds was to pursue and locate a quarry. This usually involved following the scent of either a lost child, or adult, a suspected crim, inal fleeing from authorities or an individual who had escaped confinement. There were extremely varied levels of aggression required or encouraged, depending on the specific tracking requirements. The mildest type of aggression was found in the true scent hounds. The function of these dogs required them to track down a quarry and alert its handler to the location and or to hold the quarry at bay. Naturally, a scent hound assigned the task of locating a lost child was not encouraged, nor permitted, to display any type of aggression towards the object of pursuit. In this purest form of tracking, no aggression was required or tolerated. Unfortunately, this was not the main function of scent hounds during the 1800s and early 1900s. The most extreme type of aggression in scent hounds and dogs used in law enforcement meant was found in the huge bloodhound-type dogs used to track down fleeing criminals, escaped convicts or runaway slaves. Often these dogs were encouraged to display an increased level of aggression towards humans in the performance of these tasks. While pro, professional and respectable law enforcement agencies trained their scent dogs to limit their aggression to tracking and holding their victim, there was certainly no shortage of cruel or barbaric dog handlers in the 19th century. There is ample documentation that large bloodhound-type dogs were used by some indie, vigils and certain authorities to chase down, harass, worry, and inflict wounds on the target of their pursuits. Two popular images that come to mind in association with scent dogs pursuing fleeing humans are runaway slaves being chased down by baying bloodhounds or escaped convicts desperately running from a pack of hounds on their trail. Undoubtedly, there were cases in which these images were a reality. But how much of these images was fiction and how much was based on truth was a highly contentious topic even in the era in which these incidents were reportedly taking place. There was little dispute that reportedly fierce Cuban bloodhounds were obtained during the Second Seminole War, 1835-1842, by the U.S. Army to pursue and worry the Seminole Indians who sought refuge in the swamps of Florida. And as late as 1892, the Washington Post reported that bloodhounds were being used to hunt down Apache Indy ANS in the Southwest. The Arizona legislature at its last session passed a bill for the special benefit of Cochise County, authorizing the equipment of a company of rangers to relieve that section from the depredations of the renegade Apaches. As a preliminary step for bloodhounds have been imported from Mexico and will be used for trailing the murderous savages to their mountain lair. It is known that bloodhound-type dogs were used by both the Union and Confederate armies to hunt down enemy soldiers, as well as in prison camps. And there is little dispute about the fact that bloodhounds were used to hunt down fleeing suspects. The real dispute at the time was the level of aggression attributed to these dogs. For every media account of a scent dog attacking and inflicting harm on its human quarry, there were long editorials submit, Ted to the newspapers by bloodhound aficionados explaining the noble and gentle characteristics to be found in this breed. 
The obvious point that seemed to escape notice was the fact that dogs did indeed perform in both of these fashions, i.e., savagely attack ING their quarry at times and at times showing tremendous restraint and gentleness upon reaching their quarry. As the debate swirled about the true nature and behavior of the blood hound, the evidence that owners slash handlers determined behavior was seldom discussed. Yet the evidence did present itself, time and again, that dogs mirrored the aggression of their owners slash handlers. Perhaps one of the most notable cases of canine abuse by authorities occurred during the Civil War and involved the infamous Confederate prison, Camp Sumter. This prisoner of war camp was widely known as Andersonville Prison and became notable for the abuse and cruel conditions the Union soldiers had to endure under the command of Captain Henry Wurz. The conditions at Camp Sumter were appalling, and Union war prisoners were constantly seeking to escape. The prison was reported to have maintained a pack of 40 part bloodhounds and two monstrous Cuban bloodhounds used to recapture escapees. These dogs had an additional function, to attack and injure prisoners at the direction of the guards or the commanding officers. After the Civil War, Captain Henry Wurz, commandant of Andersonville Prison, was arrested for war crimes, and after his court martial was sentenced to death by hanging. In addition to the deaths caused directly by his own hand, Captain Wurz was also found guilty of murder by inciting the camp dogs to kill federal soldiers. In his court martialings of the court charge, under specification number 11, that Henry Wurz, an officer in the military service of the so-called Confederate States of America, at Andersonville, in the state of Georgia, on or about the first day of July, A.D., 1864, then and there being commandant of a prison there located, by the authority of the said so-called Confederate States, for the confinement of prisoners of war, taken and held as such from the armies of the United States of America, while acting as said commandant, feloniously, and of his malice aforethought, did cause, incite, and urge certain ferocious and bloodthirsty animals, called bloodhounds, to pursue, attack, wound, and tear in pieces a soldier belonging to the Army of the United States, in his, the said Henry Wurz's custody as a prisoner of war, whose name is unknown, and in consequence thereof the said bloodhounds did then and there, with the knowledge, encourage, merit, sick, and instigation of him, the said Wurz maliciously and murderously given by him, attack and mortally wound the said soldier, in consequence which said mortal wound he, the said prisoner, soon thereafter, to wit, on the sixth day of July, A.D. 1864, died. This is the most extreme example of the sanctioned use of canine aggression by an author, I.T.Y. Tracking dogs were handled by every conceivable type of owner, from the most inhumane and morally corrupt to humane and serious professionals. Law enforcement departments considered the addition of a bloodhound a major advancement in their crime-fighting abilities. Some departments proudly announced the purchase of what they considered to be quality scent hounds, used exclusively to pursue and locate fleeing suspects. Other law enforcement agencies obtained dogs they considered to be more aggressive and seemed either unconcerned about the negative reputation of the type of bloodhound they acquired or per posely sought out this particular type of dog because of their reputation. In February 1903, the city of Perry, Iowa announced the upcoming acquisition of two bloodhounds, making particular note that these were southern or Cuban bloodhounds, known as the most reliable man-hunting dog on earth. Ten this variety of bloodhound was widely believed in the 1800s to be a pugnacious and fierce type of tracking dog. Other towns or cities, when acquiring bloodhounds for their law enforcement agencies, made SPE, Sile note to declare the dogs they were acquiring were of the Texas variety, 
described as the true descendants of the British bloodhounds, known for their superb tracking abilities coupled with a noble and gentle character. So while the functions of all types of scent dogs were based on their natural and SPE, stylized ability to excel in tracking quarry, their aggression towards their quarry was often determined by their handlers. Handlers who sought out the allegedly fiercer varieties of bloodhounds certainly would either directly or indirectly encourage this behavior. Handlers specifically seeking out gentler, more tractable varieties would almost certainly encourage their dogs to be less aggressive. While certain behavior may be influenced by breed, the function or purpose for which a handler slash owner obtained a dog is the controlling factor in any future behavior displayed by the dog. In addition to the use of tracking dogs by authorities, individuals also at times fancied themselves as professional handlers of scent dogs, and anyone with a type of bloodhound and a scent to follow could consider themselves a tracker. And as is often the case with dog ownership, a lack of humanity and or intelligence did not prevent the acquisition, train, ing, or keeping of dogs. An 1894 article, sarcastically titled, A Lovely Father, describes how a man recently purchased a bloodhound and decided to test the tracking abilities of the dog on his 14-year-old son. The boy was given a 15-minute head start before the father released the dog to pursue the fleeing lad. Not surprisingly, the dog did indeed catch up with his quarry, and upon reaching the unfortunate boy inflicted numerous wounds before the father could club the dog off his son. Fatal dog attacks on humans, while not unheard of or terribly surprising, were considered aired aberrations in the 1800s and early 1900s. Dogs rarely attack and kill humans, even when incited or encouraged to view humans as prey. There certainly may be undocumented cases in which tracking dogs attacked and killed fleeing individuals, Indians, enemy soul, deers, criminals. But, 19th century American society did not condone the killing of persons by dogs, even persons deemed undesirable. So the combination of this being viewed as unacceptable and potentially illegal, along with the fact that dogs rarely exhibit this behavior, explains the few recorded examples of fatal attacks by tracking slash scent dogs in the United States. One of the rare documented cases in which tracking dogs did indeed kill a fleeing S.U.S. pect was reported in Illinois in 1910. A residence in the town of Carrier Mills was discovered to have been burglarized and tracking dogs were brought to the scene. The article, Blood, Hounds Kill a Man, describes the pursuit as follows. The trail was taken up immediately and so eager were the hounds to land their quarry they broke loose from the keeper and chased the man they were pursuing to an old barn. There he was pounced upon by the animals and so badly mangled that recognition was impossible, Roberts, the owner of the dogs, was exonerated. The Washington Post, December 31, 1910 an interesting observation in the description of this attack is that, unlike most accounts in the 1800s and early 1900s, in which the dogs involved were described as savage or vicious, the dogs in this account were called eager. The description and attitude towards these dogs are vastly different from the adjectives used to describe most other fatal attacks. Hunting Dogs Unlike guard dogs or tracking dogs, there was no seemingly useful purpose in incurring ing or allowing hunting or retrieving dogs to behave aggressively towards humans. The function of hunting dogs was to assist their masters in the pursuit, capture or retrieval of game, so, not surprisingly, there are few documented cases of severe or fatal attacks by dogs used for hunting. While many other types of dogs were expected to perform dual funk, tie-ins as pet and protector, hunting dogs were not usually obtained or encouraged to double as protection dogs. 
While all dogs will provide some level of protection and guarding, the value or primary function of hunting dogs did not include the encouragement of agress shown towards humans. Aggression was more clearly directed or channeled in the hunting dogs and so there was less confusion as to what was and was not acceptable behavior, at least towards humans, as compared to dogs used for guarding slash protection. But hunting or retriever dogs will behave aggressively in the same types of situations seen with all breeds. Hunting dogs are found lashing out in pain, attacking from apparent territorial issues, chained dogs, exhibiting extreme aggression operating as a pack, and resource guarding, possessive aggression, as well as attacking for seemingly no apparent reason. Exact breed identification was not considered of paramount importance in 19th and Turi accounts describing the events that contributed to severe dog attacks, and so the dogs involved were described in broad terms as hound, retriever, bird dog, coonhound, spaniel, or simply hunting dog. While the breed identifications given by the 19th century newspapers were often vague, the circumstances believed to be driving behaviors in dogs were often recorded with precision. In 1888, a child in Lockport, New York, was fearfully disfigured by a large hunting dog. The article reports that there are some hopes for the boy's recovery. It is explained that the five-year-old was attacked after he approached the brute while he was gnawing a bone and the dog, thinking he was going to take it away, jumped at this throat. A case of pack aggression in an extremely large group of hounds is found in a 1903 account. The unfortunate victim was a 15-year-old boy approaching a kennel in which 25 hunting dogs were kept. The dogs managed to break loose of the kennel and rushed to attack the youth. The boy was quickly overcome and not even the interference of the dog's owner could stop the attack by such a large number of dogs. In desperation the owner mounted a horse in the hopes of trampling some of the dogs to save the boy. The frenzied hounds attacked and severely injured both horse and rider. The owner survived, the youth did not. Even the best of dogs with strong attachments to their owners are capable of lashing out with extreme aggression when in pain. In 1904, a report of a bird dog attacking his owner was published. Amos Miller had his face horribly mangled by his bird dog yesterday. It got its foot fast in the wire fence and he attempted to loose it, the dog sprung like a tiger upon him, bit through his right cheek and tore it beyond recognition. It required a desperate effort before the firmly set jaws of the dog could be removed. His right hand was also badly bitten. The Newark Daily Advocate, December 10, 1904 a case of a water spaniel attack found in 1896 offers no possible explanation for the extremely aggressive behavior found in this dog. At Winchester, Ohio, the three-year-old child of Mrs. Marie Cotty was attacked by a large water spaniel dog belonging to E. A. Cutter, the well-known horseman. And before assistance could be had, was literally chewed to pieces, one hand being almost bitten off. The Daily Herald, July 15, 1896 Despite the fact that the function of hunting and retrieving dogs rarely encouraged or permit aggression towards humans, all dogs regardless of breed or function are capable of displaying aggression towards humans under certain circumstances. Farm Dogs one can hardly imagine an idyllic early American farm scene without envisioning a dog somewhere in the landscape. Dogs were an integral part of farm living in America, and for good reason. Besides the basic services all dogs provide, protection and companionship, farm dogs contributed additional and often vital services to their owners. Raising and managing livestock was costly, arduous, and oftentimes dangerous work. 
Farm dogs contributed greatly to both the economic and physical welfare of their owners for a minuscule financial investment, cost of feeding. During the course of a long day, dogs worked tirelessly alongside their owners, helping to herd and control sheep, cattle and swine. Long after the day ended, dogs were still working to protect their owners' livestock from nightly predators. Besides the everyday tasks of farm living that dogs assisted with, they frequently performed a more dramatic service of protecting or saving their owners from charging bulls or aggressive hogs. Cattle caused a significant number of deaths in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There are scores of accounts of farmers being gored, trampled and killed by bulls. In addition to farmers, children, women and elderly persons were also killed when they had the misfortune to encounter an aggressive bull. In one 20-year span, from 1880 to 1899, there were over 150 recorded newspaper accounts of people being attacked and killed by cattle. Clearly, cattle presented a real and constant danger. An attack by an enraged bull was a predicament few people were able to survive. Aside from the deadly horns and their sheer size, many weighing over 1,500 pounds, bulls were often relentless in their attack, goring and trampling their victims unmercifully. In many cases, the arrival of a brave and loyal farm dog was undeniably a live-saving turn of events. All types of farm dogs, from collies and shepherds to mongrels and small dogs, could be found attacking massive bulls and hogs in defense of their owners. In February 1926, the Washington Post reported that an old collie dog saved the life of his 45-year-old owner. A prominent dairy farmer from Glenmont, Maryland, was being gored by an infuriated bull and was only saved from death when the old collie rushed to his aid, biting the bull in the throat and allowing his master to escape. On November 11, 1916, the Lima Times Democrat reported that a collie dog in Ohio saved the life of his mistress after she was knocked down and butted by an enraged cow in a corn field. On September 15, 1928, the Appleton Post Crescent reported the life-saving actions of a shepherd dog in Menominee, Michigan. A widowed farm woman was trying to drive a bull out of the barn when it turned and attacked her. Three times she was battered to the ground by the bull before Flossie, her shepherd dog, came rushing to her aid. The dog began biting the hind legs of the bull, allowing her mistress to drag herself to a platform, where she collapsed. On July 30, 1910, the Coshocton Daily Tribute tells of an equally heroic shepherd dog who rescued his master from a vicious bull on a farm near Tiverton, Ohio. The bull had recently gored another man and this farmer was about to experience a similar fate. A number of the man's ribs were broken by the impact of the bull, but the arrival and attack on the bull by the shepherd dog most assuredly saved his life. There are also numerous accounts of unidentified breeds or mongrels performing similarly heroic rescues from deadly attacks by cattle. But while collies, shepherd dogs, and mongrels are found frequently rushing to the aid of their owners, bulldogs seemed particularly quick to engage an infuriated bull or vicious hog in defense of their master or mistress. Clearly, these dogs saved more than a few lives and their acts of bravery were frequently recognized and reported in both the local and national newspapers in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In 1883, a hired hand on a farm in Pennsylvania owed his life to his bulldog. The man had been attacked and tossed three times by a bull and only managed to escape when his bulldog attacked the bull. The dog was also thrown by the bull, but was reported to have finally conquered the bull and both he and his master survived, the messenger, October 17, 1883. 
A father in Illinois reported that his bulldog saved the life of his daughter after she entered a pasture in which a bull resided. The bull charged the young girl and she made a desperate eight run to a nearby tree. The family bulldog jumped the pasture fence, attacking and driving the bull away from the terrified girl, Decatur Review, September 13, 1929. A bulldog in Moultrie, Georgia, gave his life to prevent a bull from goring his young master. The boy was driving the bull from a field when the bull turned and charged him. The boy's faithful bulldog rushed in between his master and the charging animal, gripping the bull by the nose. The dog clung to the bull until the boy had reached the safety of a nearby fence, at which point the bull shook the dog loose and gored it to death, the Haver Daily News, December 13, 1930. While bulls frequently kill people, an attack by a hog could also prove fatal. An inseat dent that occurred in Indiana shows that the arrival of a bulldog could quickly turn a helpless situation into a chance of escape and survival. Two women, the wives of prominent farm heirs, were attacked by six maddened brood sows. Their screams brought the resident bulldogs scrambling to their rescue. With one woman knocked to the ground by the sows and the other woman fighting in vain to save her companion, the arrival of the bulldog ended the combat, but not without a battle, in which one of the hogs lost part of an ear, the Indianapolis Sunday Star, November 13, 1921. Not only are bulldogs found defending their masters and mistresses from cattle and hogs, but in 1884, we find a bulldog saving a man from being killed by a horse. Thomas Scott, of the vicinity of Sandusky, was being mangled by a stallion, known as the man-eater, when a bulldog caught the horse by the nose and forced it to release its hold on the man. The dog saved the man's life and several persons will contribute for a collar to present to the dog. The Ohio Democrat, November 6, 1884 While these accounts all portray fearless dogs, sometimes the true measure of bravery is for a dog, or human, to take on danger while fear is cautioning against action. An amusingly honest account of a dog, not necessarily fearless but certainly commit, Ted and loyal to his mistress, was told in 1907. Near Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a young woman, accompanied by her large, faithful dog, had gone out to the barn to milk the cows. Before reaching the barn she encountered a maddened bull. The bull charged her and she desperately tried to protect herself with a milking stool. The bull quickly knocked her down and was attempting to gore her, when her dog began snapping at the bull's hind legs. The article describes how the dog became increasingly bolder, the snaps turning into bites and the bites then beginning to penetrate the flesh. Finally the bull turned his fury on this new enemy and, with a snort of rage, charged the dog. The dog took flight and thus began a wild chase, with the bull pursuing the dog through the farm and into nearby fields. The article reports that the dog returned home unharmed and the young woman survived with only a broken arm and some bruising, thanks to her faithful but not completely fearless dog. There are countless accounts of farmers being killed by livestock and numerous accounts of more fortunate individuals whose dogs saved them from fatal injuries, but there are exceedingly few accounts of working farm dogs attacking farmers or causing a human fatal ITY. In a few of the rare cases of fatal aggression by farm dogs, the dogs were in or near hen houses, or inside barns, at the time of the attack. In 1875, a young girl was visiting a farm in Cortland, New York, with her parents. The visiting girl and the farmer's young daughter decided to go out to the chicken coop. On the way they were joined by the large mongrel dog belonging to the farmer. As the girls reached the henhouse, 
The visiting girl opened the door and upon entering was immediately attacked by the dog. The other girl became so frightened she shut the henhouse door, trap, ping the poor child inside with the attacking dog. The child died later that night from her injuries. In 1885, an elderly farmer was removing a dead chicken from a henhouse when his dog attacked him. The attack was so relentless that the dog had to be killed before it would release the farmer from its grasp. In 1887, a dog chasing a hen under the henhouse turned and fatally bit his owner in the throat when the man crawled under the building and attempted to interfere. Other than these cases, there are few accounts of working farm dogs involved in severe-slash-fatal attacks on humans. Unlike guard dogs, most working farm dogs were maintained in environments far more conducive to producing a balanced and therefore less aggressive dog. Farm dogs were afforded more opportunities to interact with humans and other animals in positive situations and as a rule were not encouraged or allowed to behave aggressively. Working farm dogs were maintained in an environment which provided healthy exercise and mental stimulation. Additionally, territorial issues would be far less intense with farm dogs than with chained dogs or guard dogs confined in strictly defined areas. In general, the function of farm dogs produced a more social and balanced dog, allowing for more normal and appropriate behaviors towards humans.